Thank you very much. That concludes general questions. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one from Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On Tuesday, the First Minister said that she would improve the information and support that was available to victims when prisoners are released and that she would increase the transparency of the parole system. But we need the detail. Will victims and their families be able to give their testimony to parole boards in person? Will the law be changed so that the safety and welfare of victims is explicitly taken into account in decisions on early release and on parole? And what is the timescale for getting the changes that victims and families demand? We had no clarity from the First Minister on Tuesday, so can she give us some today? First Minister. Well, we will consult on all of these matters shortly. As I said on Tuesday, some of that consultation will be before the end of this year. Uh, other aspects of that consultation will be the, in the early part of next year. Just in terms of some of the content of Ruth Davidson's question, it is, of course, uh, right now the case that the Pro Board and indeed uh, the prison service in cases of temporary release can and should take into account the views of and the impact on victims of crime. What we want to do is consider whether there is a, a need to extend that. Uh, we also recognise there is a need for greater transparency around the decisions that the parole board uh, takes uh, and also where decisions about temporary release uh, are being made. So I look forward to having the views of uh, people across the parliament and also those uh, with an interest in this from outside the parliament so that we get these things right. Uh, but the last point I would make is a point I make uh, frequently in this chamber. While it is absolutely the case that it is for this government and indeed for this parliament in a wider sense to set the policy around these issues, decisions, uh, whether these are decisions about parole, bail or temporary release, are, are rightly for the independent authorities to take and I hope that is something Ruth Davidson would agree with. Ruth Davidson. I'm sure the First Minister would acknowledge that I'm asking about the framework because this is an issue that I've raised with the First Minister before. And families who feel that they're being treated as an afterthought have come to this parliament. They have met with the justice minister and their requests for change have been denied. That's why the Stuart family, who lost their daughter Michelle, are now campaigning for greater rights and who received this letter from Hamza Youssef yesterday. They had this to say about the SNP's plans. Lots of warm words, but nothing concrete. That's their verdict on what the first minister is proposing. Aren't they right? First Minister. Oh, Hamza Yousaf has met with the Stuart family. He met with the Stuart family on the 3rd of August to discuss uh, their understandable concerns over the treatment of victims in the justice system. And I can say uh, to Ruth Davidson, indeed to the, the Chamber, and most importantly of all to the Stuart family themselves today, we are actively considering uh, the Stuart family's proposals and indeed other calls for improvements in detail. We are already in discussion with the Parole Board on further reforms and possible development of their rules of procedure. And of course, that has to include whether any changes are necessary following the War Boys case in uh, England. Uh, as I understand it, uh, the Stuart family have uh, raised three broad areas where they think uh, reform is necessary. Uh, firstly, the safety and welfare of victims uh, when parole and air release uh, decisions are being taken. And I think that is important that we do consider that fully and carefully. Uh, Secondly, increase, increasing the use of inclusion zones uh, into which uh, serious prisoners are not allowed to be uh, relocated when freed. Uh, conditions like that can already be put on licences, but it's important to look at whether more can be done. And thirdly, toughening of the victim notification scheme. So all of these things have been taken into account and will continue to be considered in full uh, by the government. And I would hope that we would get views, uh, certainly of the Stuart family, of other families who have views on these matters and parties across the chamber. Ruth Davidson. Well, the issue here, presenting officer, is that it isn't just about one case. It goes far, far wider. And over the summer, we were contacted by other families, including the Carsons from Hart Hill. Their dad, Mike Mosey, a former policeman, was bludgeoned to death in his kitchen. The killer was sentenced to 18 years, which was then reduced to just 13 on appeal. And this June, after being told of rumours that he was to be released early, they wrote to the Scottish Prison Service and were told that that wasn't the case. But then, just six weeks later, they received another letter informing them that, in fact, he had already been approved for temporary release. A letter which coincided with the anniversary of Mike's murder. The family have been left traumatised and they feel that the system has totally let them down. And I know that the First Minister will agree with me that a case like this is unacceptable. But doesn't that only demonstrate the need to act decisively now 
to show victims and their families that we are listening. First Minister. The case uh, that Ruth Davidson has cited is unacceptable and I know the Justice uh, Secretary would be happy to meet with uh, that family if they uh, want to do so. Of course there are a range of actions that we have already taken in this area. We have already uh, changed the rules on automatic early release for example to reduce the circumstances in which prisoners can be released earlier. Uh, some of the issues that Ruth Davidson is rightly raising can already be taken into account and should already be taken into account uh, by either the parole board and decisions around parole or by the Scottish Prison Service and decisions around early release. Uh, but it's exactly because of the kind of experience that Ruth Davidson uh, has narrated in her last question that we do think we need to look at what more needs to be done to ensure that victims uh, and families of victims are given uh, proper notice and where appropriate properly consulted when these decisions are taken. So I think it is right uh, that we set out the package uh, of reforms that we did earlier this week and we will take these forward now taking full consideration of the views of victims, of the views of families of victims and indeed the views of people across the chamber. That's the right way to proceed uh, and we will do that as quickly as possible. Ruth Davidson. But the officer, the Stuarts and the Carsons and families like them are not asking for the world. They're just asking to be heard when the killers of their loved ones are being released. They feel that criminals have more rights than victims and they want the law changed so that victims are put at the heart of the justice system, which is where they should be. They are here in Parliament today because they want their experience to help others. When will the government do right by these families, end the warm words without concrete action, and finally adopt Michelle's law in full? First Minister. Well, can I... Um I'm not clear whether the Stuart family are in the chamber. If, if they are, uh, let me uh, issue a welcome to them and give them an assurance that both the Justice Secretary and myself uh, are very happy and willing to continue to liaise with them about changes they think are required to be made. I think two things are important here. Firstly, I think it's important that we do stress where either the Parole Board or the Scottish Prison Service can already do the things that families understandably think should be done and that we make sure uh, these things are done consistently. So, for example, it is the case already uh, that the Scottish Prison Service or the Parole Board uh, can take account and I think should take account of the impact on prisoners uh, when decisions, uh, or on victims when decisions are being taken. Uh, the Parole Board, for example, can already impose licence conditions preventing offenders going to specific places or contacting specific people. So let's firstly make sure that the provisions that are already in place are being applied properly and appropriately. But then let's also make sure that we are listening to people who think there are further things that we need to do. That's exactly what we are doing. That's exactly what we will continue to do. Uh, and the Stuart family and any other family who have concerns of this nature have my absolute assurance on that. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, presiding officer, over the recess under freedom of information, an email dated the 30th of April was published. It was from the Chief Executive of Education Scotland to the Deputy First Minister. The email revealed that a pornographic image had been shared on Yammer, the social media app used in Scotland's schools, including primary schools. The image had been viewed a hundred times. It had been viewed by children. The Deputy First Minister asked for the guidance of his officials. He was told by civil servants that, and I quote, it is inevitable that young people will be exposed at some point to inappropriate material. So he took no action. First Minister, why did the Yammer app stay online for a further six weeks after this incident? First Minister. Well, as I understand it, when that uh, image appeared and was drawn uh, to the attention of officials, it was removed. Uh, Yammer, of course, now, uh, as we speak, remains offline for pupils uh, while the relevant issues are being examined in detail as part of the review that Education Scotland is undertaking. And that's because we take the safeguarding of children, information security and data protection very seriously. So I would hope that Richard Leonard would actually welcome the action that was taken and welcome uh, the fact that we are continuing to take a very precautionary approach to this because right now pupils cannot access Yammer and will not be able to do so until we are satisfied that these issues have been properly resolved. Richard Leonard. Presiding officer, I accept uh, that the First Minister uh, took that app down but it was only on the 11th of June after parents had raised concerns with the First Minister. 
But the Deputy First Minister was told about this on the 30th of April, and for six weeks he did not act. What's more, the app is now back online, yet the government still has not installed proper safeguarding measures. So who authorised that decision to put the app back online? Was it the First Minister or was it the Deputy First Minister? First Minister. Well, as I understand it, Yammer is only uh, currently available to staff. Yammer is offline for pupils and I think that is uh, an important matter. In terms of the incidents that were drawn to the attention of Education Scotland and then the Deputy First Minister, uh, in April they uh, were alerted to a single inappropriate image in Yammer. As I understand it, that image was removed. Uh, then we were alerted to another incident in June and it became clear that suspension of the Yammer network at that stage was required until all of these issues could be properly resolved. Uh, that process is underway. So I think the right actions have been taken, the precautionary actions have been taken and I would hope that all people across the chamber who understand I think as we do that we've got to strike the right balance between the educational benefits of online systems like this and the safety of young people. It, that balance is critical and we're acting in a way to ensure exactly that balance. Richard Leonard. So can I just recap? Here's what we know. The Deputy First Minister was told about pornographic material on this app in April, and the app remained online until June. The government is only now looking for a safeguarding product for Yammer, with the specification expected to be issued tomorrow at the earliest. So not only did the government relaunch this app without proper safeguarding, it relaunched it without knowing what proper safeguarding looks like. Teachers and parents continue to be concerned, and they are right. They deserve straight answers. So will the First Minister today order an urgent investigation into her government's handling of this? And will she report back to Parliament in full all of the findings? First Minister. I'm, I'm not sure if Richard Leonard heard uh, some of my previous answer. There is an investigation and a review already underway, being carried out by Education Scotland. Yammer is offline to pupils. Pupils cannot currently access it and will not be able to access it until we are satisfied that those issues are resolved. I think that is the responsible and appropriate action to have taken. In terms of uh, the actions of the Deputy First Minister, just let me, let me recap here. In April, a single inappropriate image uh, was identified. It was immediately uh, removed. At that point, there was no indication that there was any concern about wider uh, systemic issues about Yammer. But when a second incident was reported in June, uh, not only uh, was uh, the image removed, but Yammer was taken offline for pupils. That, I think, is absolutely the right action uh, to have been taken. And I'm surprised that Richard Leonard is not welcoming that. And we will continue to put the safety of children paramount here by ensuring that Yammer is not accessible to pupils until we are absolutely satisfied that all of these issues have been properly resolved. I actually uh, believe that that is the appropriate action for the Deputy First Minister to have taken and I would hope that members would agree with it. Thank you. We've got a number of constituency supplementaries. We'll see how much progress we make. First one from Neil Findlay. <laughs> Today, the Scotsman and Evening News newspaper highlight the tragic death of 75-year-old Mrs Eileen Baxter from Lone Head in my region. It listed as one of the contributory factors in her death is a mesh implant. This, I believe, is the first time mesh has been specifically cited as one of the underlying causes of a woman's death in Scotland. With this new information, will the First Minister now instruct an inquiry into Mrs Baxter's death? Will she instruct NHS boards not to buy one more box of mesh implants? Will she instruct the NHS to clear their shelves of all mesh? And will she make sure that not another implant is carried out in Scotland using this grotesque and deadly product? First Minister. Well, can I... Can I thank Neil Finlay for raising uh, this extremely serious issue? Uh, and first of all, I want to convey my 
sincere condolences to the family and friends uh, of Ms Baxter. Uh, of course, the Scottish Government doesn't hold information on individual patients or their treatment, but if we are supplied with information on Ms Baxter's case, we will give that very careful consideration and uh, consider when, whether any further review or inquiry into that specific case is required. On the issue of uh, MESH, more generally, it's a, an issue I'll be discussing further uh, later today with the Health Secretary. Uh, the use, other than in exceptional circumstances, remains uh, under suspension in NHS Scotland. We've seen the number of operations fall uh, dramatically. Uh, in the six months to March this year, uh, there were 33 operations carried out. Uh, that compares to over 1,100 in the similar period in 2013-14. Uh, uh, so we will continue to have that suspension in place until the Chief Medical Officer uh, is satisfied. The Chief Medical Officer also announced some further actions following the Petitions Committee uh, report. Medical devices, of course, across the UK are regulated by the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, um, and that is a reserved uh, matter. But we will continue to work within uh, the health service to ensure that we are taking appropriate action. As I said, at the outset of my question, this is an issue I'll be discussing uh, later on uh, further with the Health Secretary, and uh, the Health Secretary will keep Parliament fully updated. Thank you. Question number Ezra. Willie Coffey. Thank you. The First Minister will be aware of the announcement by TMD Friction in Hurlford in my constituency that 86 jobs are to be lost as the company moves its operation to England. What help, if any, can we provide to the company and staff affected by this devastating news? And what assistance can the Scottish Government provide to support Scottish manufacturing companies to improve their competitiveness at this time when European manufacturing is under significant cost pressures from emerging markets? First Minister. Well, thank you to Willie Coffey for raising this issue. I was disappointed to learn of the proposed closure of the TMD friction site in Hurlford in his constituency. This is obviously a blow to the local area and will be an anxious time for affected employees. Uh, Scottish Enterprise is already engaging with the company and will meet with local management as soon as possible to discuss the decision. Uh, PACE will also meet uh, with TMD today to discuss support for employees who are facing redundancy. Uh, and PACE will aim to obviously minimise the time any individuals affected by redundancy are out of work. In terms of manufacturing, more generally our manufacturing Action Plan reaffirms the commitment we have to growing and investing in the sector and putting innovation at the heart of the growth in the manufacturing uh, sector. That's why we're investing £48 million into developing the new National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland, which will be an industry-led international centre of advanced manufacturing expertise and skills. Uh, and I think that can help secure Scotland's place as a global leader in advanced manufacturing. Andy Whiteman. On Monday this week, my constituent, Kweko Adeboli, was detained by the Home Office and is now in Dungable Detention Centre, facing imminent deportation to Ghana. In 2012, he was convicted of financial fraud as a result of systemic recklessness within the banking industry. He's now served his sentences and been making a positive contribution to society by working with industry leaders and politicians. Can I ask the First Minister what support the Scottish Government can provide to Mr Adeboli, who's being forcibly removed from his home to a country he barely knows, and whether she regards this as a proportionate decision in light of Mr Adeboli's long-established residence in the UK and in recent years in Scotland? First Minister. Well, can I thank Andy Whiteman for raising uh, this case? I do have uh, concerns about this case, as I have uh, frequently about how immigration uh, cases uh, are treated. Uh, and I appreciate that this will be an extremely stressful and difficult time for Mr Adeboli uh, and his friends and family. I think it stands to reason, I think most people would accept this, that it's right that questions of uh, character and criminality should be a factor in any immigration system. However, it is also important that the UK government gives due consideration to individual circumstances. And I think that uh, would include, in this case, the positive contribution that this uh, individual has made to life in Scotland. The Scottish Government welcomes known UK citizens from all over the world uh, and welcomes their contribution to our country. So we will continue to push generally for an immigration system that recognises individual circumstances and provides a welcoming environment. And of course, we are always uh, willing to consider whether there is uh, assistance we can give in individual uh, cases. And the External Affairs Secretary, I'm sure, would be happy to discuss this constituency case directly with Mr Whiteman. And Polly McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the First Minister will be only too aware of the de devastating Glasgow School of Art fire affecting residents and businesses on Suckey Hall Street. May I take this opportunity 
To thank the First Minister for her personal intervention to set up the £5 million fund to help those businesses affected. But she might know that today the Contemporary Arts Centre, which has been closed since then, it was due to open the 14th of this month, has no date yet for opening. They have still to receive their £20,000, which they've applied for, and they are in grave danger of closing. Can the First Minister act today to release those funds and would she agree to meet with me and some of the businesses such as Beagle Mania who have not been able to access the fund at all? I wonder if the First Minister would consider if there was any money left in that fund then it could go towards the businesses who feel that they may be out of business because of the Glasgow School of Art fire. First Minister. For what is a very important issue uh, in the city of Glasgow and I think an important national issue. Um, I considered and the government considered that it was right to set up a fund as we did over the summer to help businesses most directly affected by the impact uh, of uh, the art school fire but also the earlier fire in Socky Hall Street. Uh, we will try to be as flexible as possible around applications to that and if there are particular businesses uh, who perhaps initially are not eligible that Polly McNeill wants to bring to our attention I will ensure that that is given proper uh, consideration. Uh, I am aware of the particular difficulties that the CCA uh, is experiencing. Uh, they already received public funding as an arts organisation, which has meant that more time has been needed to process their application for money uh, from this fund. But I will uh, personally seek an update on that today and ensure that Polly McNeill gets that information as soon as possible. Generally, we will continue to work with Glasgow City Council to do everything we possibly can to reduce the impact of these two devastating fires uh, on businesses and individuals in the city of Glasgow. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. There are certainly elements of the government's new programme uh, which are welcome. The continued commitment to a fairer system of income tax, the creation of a South of Scotland agency and a young carers grant, many issues which the Greens had proposed. But big problems do remain. Teaching unions, for example, have been deeply disappointed by the lack of a plan to tackle the growing teacher shortage in Scotland or commit to a fair pay deal. And the government's own figures published this week show public satisfaction with local services in deep decline, from local health services to public transport and a big decline in satisfaction with schools. The First Minister must agree that this situation isn't acceptable. So what needs to change to ensure that the services in our local communities, which we all rely on, are protected and delivered to the high standard that people in Scotland deserve? First Minister. Well, there's a range of issues uh, raised by Patrick Harvey in, in that series of, of questions. In, in terms of education and pay negotiations, the uh, teacher pay negotiations uh, are underway uh, today uh, as we speak. Uh, hopefully they will uh, resolve well in the near future. Um, in terms of the EIS, I noted that the EIS uh, actually said the other day there were some very welcome statements in the programme for government uh, listed what many of those welcome statements were. In terms of satisfaction with uh, public services, if we look at the figures published just uh, the other day if, uh, in terms of people who use our public services uh, for local health services, it's over 80% satisfaction. For, over, uh, for local schools, it's almost 90% satisfaction. For public transport, uh, well over 70% satisfaction. So uh, that's a good basis, but our uh, priority is to continue to protect and support services. Patrick Harvey, um, I think at the end uh, there, asked me what needs to change. Well, what we need to do is continue what we are doing. Uh, we, in the budget for this year, delivered a real terms increase in the resources that our local authorities have. We're delivering more money uh, to ensure that we're closing the attainment gap in our schools. We're taking action on our railways, for example, to ensure uh, that passenger services improve. So we will continue to take a range of action to make sure that this country has the public services it needs and deserves. Patrick Harvey. Of course, these are not separate issues. They're brought together by a single situation that our local service providers, and in particular local councils, are facing rising demand and don't have the financial powers that they need to meet that demand fairly. They're left all too often having to make the decision between cuts to services or increasing fees and charges. We've seen situations with free swimming cut, with increases on childcare charges, councils forced to increase people's transport costs or introduce new charges 
for music tuition, leading to a huge number of children simply losing out. Our polling shows that 85% of people in Scotland want their councils to have better powers to raise funds fairly. Doesn't the First Minister agree that cutting services or hiking fees and charges is the least fair, least progressive and least sensible way of paying for the local services in communities across Scotland? First Minister. Well, the Scottish Government's job is to ensure that we give uh, fair funding settlements to local government. It's then for local government to take the decisions they think are appropriate in their local uh, communities. Uh, but the settlement uh, this year for this uh, year's budget delivered a real terms increase for local authorities, both in their revenue budget and indeed in their, their capital uh, budget. And that's before we take account of the resources local authorities can raise themselves uh, through council tax, for example. So we will continue to ensure a fair settlement for local government within a context, of course, uh, in which uh, our budget, the Scottish Government's budget, continues to be subject to pressures and cuts from the Westminster uh, government. Uh, in terms of the, the wider question, I think Patrick Carvey was, uh, was getting at there in terms of should local authorities have more powers to decide themselves what revenue to raise? I'm sure that is a discussion uh, this parliament will have in the run up to the draft budget this year and the final budget next year. The government is certainly open to suggestions as we have been in previous previous budget rounds and we'll continue to consider carefully uh, ideas and suggestions that come forward, whether they come from parties within this chamber or for local government itself. There's room for some additional supplementaries. The first from John Mason. Hey, thank you. I think the First Minister may be aware of the incident that uh, allegedly happened at St Alphonso's Church uh, in my constituency stemming from an orange march. Uh, we can have over 200 of these marches in a particular year. Would the First Minister agree with me that there needs to be restrictions both on the numbers and on the routes of such marches? First Minister. Well, firstly, I was absolutely appalled, as I am sure everybody across this chamber was, uh, at the incident that took place outside St Alphonsus uh, Church. Uh, nobody, absolutely nobody, should ever be a target of hatred uh, because of their faith, and the Scottish Government will always uh, be very clear about that in our response. Uh, I do understand the concerns uh, that have been raised uh, that John Mason has just reflected in the Chamber. Responsibility for the regulation of marches and parades, of course, does rest with local authorities, and it's important that they work with Police Scotland uh, because they are best placed to make decisions that balance the rights of people to march, but also, very importantly, the rights of, of others in our communities. Uh, and we would always encourage uh, action which brings different parties involved together uh, to try to find constructive ways forward. Kezia Dugdale. Thank you. Last week there was a petrol bomb attack on Edinburgh's Gurdwara. Thankfully no one was hurt but there was considerable smoke damage and there's no doubt that it has left people feeling fearful, upset and alarmed. The multicultural and diverse community of Leith have rallied in support but can I ask the First Minister what her government can and will do to allay the fears of the Sikh community, crack down on all crimes fueled by hate and promote a culture of inclusion and respect? First Minister. Everything we do, not just as a government, but right across this parliament, right across uh, our country, should be ensuring that everybody, regardless of their faith, race, background, uh, culture, feels safe and secure in Scotland. And it's incumbent on all of us to have a zero tolerance against any attack on anybody that is motivated uh, by hatred of their faith or their race. Uh, last week, the Justice Secretary and the Community Secretary engaged uh, with the Sikh community to try to allay the concerns that they understandably have, and we will continue uh, to do that. Of course, we are also, as we announced in the Programme for Government, uh, about to undertake a, a review of hate crime laws, and I think that is a welcome opportunity to look at uh, whether further protections are necessary. I uh, know the impact that attacks like this, the reprehensible attack, uh, that Kezia Dugdale has raised in the chamber today. I know the impact they have uh, in communities. Uh, there, are, uh, there is more than one uh, Gurdwara in my own constituency, uh, and it was impacted by what happened in Edinburgh. So it's important that all of us stand in solidarity and side by side with all of the wonderful communities that make up our wonderful, diverse country. Emma Harper. Thank you. Um, figures out today show that Scottish exports have increased by 7% to 28.8 billion. This is faster than any other nation in the UK, but there is a significant untapped potential. How will the Scottish Government capitalise on this? And how will we tackle the threat posed by the UK Government dragging Scotland out of the world's largest single market, which will have a negative impact on Scotland, including my South Scotland constituents? First Minister. 
Well, these uh, export figures today are excellent. 7% uh, increase in Scottish exports, uh, as Emma Harper says, the fastest growth of any uh, UK nation. Uh, of course, we saw yesterday uh, growth in tourism figures as well, and particularly a growth in the number of EU visitors coming to Scotland at a time when that is declining elsewhere in the UK. So it underlines the importance to us of continued uh, membership of the single market. Uh, we are doing well in exports, but as I said uh, on Tuesday in the programme for government, I think we need to do uh, even better, which is why I announced a £20 million package uh, which will work with business on uh, to ensure that we're encouraging and supporting our businesses to export even more. John Scott. And thank you, Presiding Officer. <clears throat> First Minister will be aware of the dangerous state of the station hotel in Ayr, which is causing disruption to rail services across the west of Scotland. Most recent plans to mitigate this problem include bringing longer trains from Glasgow and stopping them at Prestwick Town, where car parking space is very limited. In order to relieve congestion in Prestwick on a temporary basis, would the First Minister consider asking Prestwick Airport to make parking available at the airport free of charge to rail users until this crisis is resolved and normal services are resumed so that rail passengers can use the Prestwick Airport stop as well to reduce congestion at Prestwick Town Station. First Minister. Well, in terms of the general issue around the station hotel in Ayr, it's an area I know very well. I was in the chamber on Tuesday when Michael Matheson answered a question about the important issues around that. But on the specific suggestion that John Scott has made, hearing it for the first time, I think it sounds like a very good suggestion. So I will undertake to take that away and discuss it with relevant officials and come back to them as quickly as possible. But it certainly seems like a positive suggestion and one that I can't immediately think of any objection that anybody could have to. But obviously I would have to... Uh, discuss it, uh, <laughs> did, which, which is not something I can often say about suggestions that come from uh, that side of the chamber. But seriously, uh, we know the pressure that this is putting on commuters. So we will take that positive suggestion away and come back to John Scott as quickly as we possibly can. Question number four, Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government will take to support the mental well-being of our young people. First Minister. We set out a package of measures in the programme for government this week to do more to support positive mental health, prevent ill health and ensure that those who need specialist care can access it more quickly. These new actions build on our mental health strategy and will be backed by a quarter of a billion pounds of additional investment starting this year and increasing over the subsequent four years. Uh, this includes £50 million to improve perinatal mental health, over £60 million for additional counselling services uh, and £20 million for school nurses, £65 million to develop a community mental wellbeing service for 5 to 24 year olds, offering immediate access to counselling and to family and peer support. Fulton McGregor. I thank the First Minister for that response. I recently held a children and young persons mental health event in my constituency where local and national stakeholders came together with local young people for a constructive discussion. One of the issues that came to the fore was an apparent lack of access to community CAM services for those aged between 16 and 18 who were not in education. Can the First Minister confirm if the expanded community we mental wellbeing services outlined in this week's programme for government will be an opportunity for NHS boards to ensure that all young people, including those out with school or college, can get the support they require? First Minister. Uh, yes, community mental wellbeing services must be designed so it is easier for children, young people uh, and their families and carers to access the help they need when they need it. Uh, they mustn't be designed uh, around criteria like whether the young person is still in school. So I would expect all NHS boards to provide age appropriate mental health services for young people, uh, including those who are not in education. More generally, I think it is expansion of community services, including services in schools, that is the key to uh, dramatically improve uh, services for young people. Uh, if we look at the specialist CAMS uh, service, and obviously we had the statistics published uh, the other day, o over the last quarter actually more young people were seen by the CAMS service and more seen within 18 weeks. Uh, the percentage fell because demand is rising uh, so fast. Now, what we need to do is make sure that young people are not being referred into the CAMS specialist service because of a lack of community provision. And that's what the focus of the investment that I announced the other day will very much be on. And if we get that right, we will also make sure that those uh, suffering from the, the more serious ill health do get access to specialist services as quickly as possible. Alex Cole-Hamilton. 
Presiding officer, uh, coming as this does, uh, the week that Scotland posted its worst ever waiting time statistics for child and adolescent mental health services, the programme for government money is of course welcome. But does the First Minister recognise that this isn't just about health services, but about training educationalists to understand the uh, very specific mental health needs of children suffering trauma, attachment disorder and loss? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do. And uh, I think I, I specifically mentioned on Tuesday the fact that some of the investment that uh, we have now dedicated will go to ensuring that teachers have the materials they need and uh, ensuring that all local authorities uh, have access to mental health first aid training for teachers, uh, which is a really important part of this. So uh, equipping those who are working with young people, making sure there's a range of services available in the community and making sure our specialist services are available to those who most need them as quickly as possible. These are the three prongs uh, of the approach that we want to take. I would repeat again, I am not trying to shy away from the figures uh, that were published on Tuesday, but when you look at the detail of these figures, it's clear that the system is doing more. It's seeing more people, it's seeing more people within 18 weeks, uh, but rising demand is outstripping uh, that capacity to deliver. So we need to reform as well as invest. We've invested a lot in mental health services, increased funding, increased number of staff, but the reform to make sure there's more community services available is key to making sure that we get this right for every young person who needs these services. Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A few days after celebrating Christmas with his partner Karen and their two young children, my constituent Luke Henderson completed suicide. As reported in the Sunday Post, Luke pleaded with health services for help eight times in the six days directly before he died, but was either turned away or referred elsewhere. Now, nothing will bring Luke back, but his family desperately want to know that lessons have been learned from the catalogue of failures that led to his preventable death. Will the First Minister please ask the Minister for Mental Health to meet with Karen McKeown and take urgent action to review suicide prevention procedures in NHS Lanarkshire? First Minister. Uh, well, the Mental Health uh, Minister will, of course, be willing to meet with Luke's family and uh, if Monica Lennon wants to uh, give us the details of that, we will set up that meeting as quickly as possible. And if there are lessons that need to be learned from this or from any case by any NHS board, that it's essential that that is done, of course. Uh, in June, uh, or sorry, over the summer, we also published the uh, Suicide Prevention Plan, which is looking at the additional actions uh, that we need to take to make sure that the number of suicides in Scotland continues uh, to reduce, and we set uh, another uh, target for reduction. But of course, I'm aware, always uh, aware, that when we talk about statistics around suicide, uh, we should never forget that one suicide is one too many um, and leaves uh, a bereaved family in its wake. So we must all make sure we do everything possible to reduce that uh, and to learn lessons where that is required. So uh, the Mental Health Minister would, of course, be happy to meet with Luke's family. Question number five, Miles Briggs. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking in response to chest, heart and stroke Scotland's call for an increase in the use of thrombectomy procedures. First Minister. We recognise the benefits of thrombectomy, uh, which can significantly improve outcomes and quality of life for people who have had an ischemic stroke by avoiding or reducing the level of disability. Uh, that's why the Directors of Planning uh, Thrombectomy Advisory Group are progressing development of a national planning framework uh, for its provision in Scotland, and that group is due to report in spring next year. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Um, the procedure has recently been withdrawn from NHS Lothian. The Scottish Government itself has said that up to 600 stroke patients across Scotland a year could benefit from this procedure, helping to avoid, as the First Minister has said, uh, significant levels of disability caused by stroke. Can I ask, although I welcome the fact that a plan has been developed, when does the First Minister today believe a deadline has to be put in place to see a national thrombectomy service is put in place for Scotland, like is already the case in England and Northern Ireland? First Minister. Well, before giving uh, that uh, date, I think it is important to allow the advisory group to do its work. As I said in my original answer, that group will report in spring uh, next year and then its uh, recommendations will be taken forward uh, as quickly as possible. It is the, object the, the member refers to NHS Lothian. I think the issues experienced in NHS Lothian underline the importance of developing a national planning framework for the provision uh, of this procedure. So I will ask the Health Secretary to keep the member uh, fully updated as this work progresses. Question number six, Jenny Mara. 
to ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking in response to the rising number of drug deaths. First Minister. Addressing drug-related deaths is a public health priority for this government, and uh, I use the term public health priority uh, deliberately. Uh, we are today sharing a draft version of our new alcohol and drug strategy uh, with stakeholders from across the sector. Uh, that will inform a process of engagement by the public health minister to inform the final strategy, which will be published in the autumn. Uh, the strategy will look at how services can adapt to find uh, people most in need and deliver services that address their specific circumstances. It will also set out detailed actions for reducing the number of drug-related deaths. Uh, we've just released further funding, bringing the total provided for alcohol and drug partnerships to over £70 million in this financial year to help reduce the harms caused by alcohol and drugs. Uh, this further £20 million of investment has been allocated to support new approaches which respond to the needs of those who are most at risk in a more joined up and person centred way. Jenny Mara. I'm sure that strategy will be very welcome, but the First Minister knows that drug treatment can reduce deaths. In some European countries, 80% of problem drug users are in treatment. In England, 60% are treated. In Scotland, we only treat 40%. Our death toll, which rose this past year, shows the human cost of this public health failure. There is nothing in the First Minister's programme for government this week to tackle this huge public health crisis. Specifically, what will the First Minister do to increase treatment rates and reduce the death toll across Scotland? Because the human cost of this is immeasurable. First Minister. Well, I agree with the importance of getting uh, people into uh, treatment. That's why we've allocated the additional funding uh, that I spoke about in my initial answer to expand uh, the ability uh, of services uh, to cater for people who need treatment. It's also important to say that drug and alcohol treatment waiting times have greatly uh, reduced. Almost 94% of people are now being seen within three weeks of referral. Uh, I don't think it's true to say there's nothing around the Scottish Government's programme for government. The strategy that I spoke about earlier on is ongoing work that is extremely important in this uh, area. Of course, we also uh, are very keen to support uh, health services and local authorities uh, with more innovative uh, approaches. Uh, the Programme for Government, uh, for example, discusses our support for the proposals in Glasgow for a uh, safer drug consumption facility. Uh, Unfortunately, right now, that's not within the power of the Parliament uh, to do, and that's why we hope to encourage uh, the UK Government uh, to move forward on this. So across a range uh, of these issues, it's vital that we ensure that uh, people do have access to services, so the additional funding and the reduction in waiting times are both important measures in that respect. Question number seven, Tavish Scott. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister, in light of the comment by the teaching union EIS that the recent review's recommendations will do little to allay the very serious concerns held by many teachers, whether the Scottish Government plans further changes to the Scottish National Standardised Assessments. First Minister. In the first year of the Scottish National Standardised Assessments, over 578,000 assessments were completed at a completion rate of 94%. The user review report reflects upon the experience of the first year and lists a number of important enhancements, including the establishment of a primary one practitioners forum. Uh, moving forward, case studies will be shared with teachers on interpreting the data provided by the assessment system and using it for improvement purposes. Feedback questions will be added to the system to allow children, young people and teachers to share their experience of the assessments. Uh, intelligence gained from these enhancements to the system will be used to inform the continuous improvement of them. Uh, thank you. Uh, when the Parliament votes to stop the testing of four and five-year-olds in primary one classes across Scotland, will the government accept that decision? Well, we'll continue to make the case for what we are doing. I think it's important to sort of take a calm look at this. Uh, assessments are not new in Scottish education. 29 out of 32 councils were already doing primary one assessments. In fact, the majority of councils did two a year. What the Scottish Government has done is standardise them so that all councils are using the same tool uh, and we've made them more relevant to the curriculum for excellence levels. The assessments provide important diagnostic information to inform teacher judgment on how uh, children are developing and I think that's important. So if there are areas where children need extra help, they get that extra help as quickly as possible. They're not high stakes, they're not tests, there's no pass or fail. And of course, if a teacher doesn't think 
uh, that a young person should undertake the assessment, that is within their discretion. So this is about ensuring that we get the best possible help to children as early as possible, which of course is an important part of raising standards in our schools and closing the attainment gap. Thank you very much. That concludes First Minister's questions. We're going to move on now to members' business in the name of Liam Kerr on the campaign, uh, the Michelle's Law campaign. And uh, I'm conscious that members want to get into the gallery, so there'll be a, a short suspension where we allow people to leave the gallery and allow the new uh, members to come in.